Jessica. Well, great having you. It is a pleasure to introduce Carl Cerniak, um, team lead at MIT Lincoln Lab and in the engineering quantum systems group at MIT. You're an expert, Kyle, in the field of superconducting qubits, researching a, a wide area of, uh, of phenomena, design and control of noise protected superconducting qubits, understanding and mitigating the effects of non equilibrium quasi particles in superconducting devices, using quantum circuits to probe new material systems and on and on. Um, before joining MIT, Kyle was at Yale University, uh, where you worked in uh, Michel de Forest's group, and uh, before that at Florida State University. Now we are really excited welcoming Kyle to, in, to give the introduction to superconducting qubits. Please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that very nice introduction. Um, before getting started, uh, it's absolutely worth thanking all of the organizers for putting together this wonderful, this wonderful series of talks, this wonderful program throughout the summer uh, that's able to reach so many people. That's really, that's really, really impressive. Uh, and I'm really excited to be able to, uh, to, to, to contribute to that. Um, so yeah, today I'm really excited to, to share with you a little bit about the field that I work in uh, called superconducting qubits. Um, so so let's, uh, let's just get started. Um, there will be many talks throughout this uh, this program on different uh, what we would call hardware modalities for quantum computing, um, and and what that really means is that the sort of base, the fundamental building blocks of all of these of uh, of any sort of future quantum computer, uh, you know, it relies on some actual physical quantum system um, that can be controlled and and manipulated in order to do computations. And and there are you know a wide variety of uh, of those types of systems that are that are currently being pursued by uh, by by our research community. Um, there are some that really evoke a picture of uh, sort of quantum systems that you would think to be oh that's obviously that's obviously going to behave quantum mechanically. So um, there are there are systems that that rely upon the spin of trapped electrons or um, the motional states of of atoms or ions that are trapped in in, in some um, energy potential landscape, and those are those are really easy to understand as as sort of real quantum building blocks, things that things that are going to exhibit quantum behavior that that you could imagine to be um, uh, useful and and harnessed for quantum computation. But there's actually there are a few other uh, hardware modalities that uh, rely on quantum effects that are manifested sort of through engineering. So by tuning uh, parameters of some physical system such that they're able to exhibit quantum mechanical phenomena. Uh, these sort of, we would maybe call them engineered quantum systems, are also really, really intriguing, um, really, really intriguing uh, pathways uh, for, for realization of quantum computation um, because they give a lot of flexibility. They give a lot of flexibility um, in, in the quantum systems that one can, can design and engineer and as well as their properties. Um, and so superconducting qubits, semiconductor qubits, and photonic qubits are all kind of in that camp. So again, today, um, I'll talk about superconducting qubits and, and give you some of the, the sort of advantages, disadvantages of this platform relative to others, uh, as well as go into sort of the fundamental physics that underpins um, superconducting qubits. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, one, of, one of the main highlights of superconducting qubits is that it's an engineered quantum system. And, and as, I'll, as I'll share with you throughout this talk, uh, what that means is that a lot of the parameters, a lot of the features um, of the individual quantum systems that we use for computation can be tuned by choices, either in the way we construct the qubits. These are physical construction. You, you, know, you, could, you can go into a clean room and make these things um, however you want. Um, uh, and that's uh, something that's really powerful. Um, another thing that's really powerful is that superconducting qubits uh, can largely leverage uh, components that are commercially available. Now, the actual qubits themselves are somewhat bespoke. You know, it's 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 clean room or you know semiconductor fabrication type techniques um, that that are relied on uh, to create them. But the rest of it, the connecting of of qubits together and actual doing measurements, actually operating the system. It really leverages sort of commercially available, um, you know, hardware. Um, I mentioned that 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 they're fabricated using sort of established fabrication techniques from the semiconductor manufacturing industry. Um, 
Another, another nice advantage is that they have relatively fast operation, which means that you can do uh, logic gates on them quite quickly uh, relative to some other modalities. Um, and, and maybe the biggest, the, biggest, uh, the biggest thing in my mind that's really driving forward uh, research and progress in this field is just the sheer size of it. Um, there's a really large academic research community uh, devoted to uh, progressing the field of superdiamond qubits um, and, and, and more and more uh, large-scale industrial efforts that, that make a lot of headlines um, are also focusing on the superconducting qubit hardware modality. And that's not to say that that, that isn't the same case for, um, for other modalities, but, but those, are, those are strong points of superconducting qubits. Um, and so throughout this talk, uh, we're going to focus on, again, superconducting qubits as a physical architecture for quantum computation. And uh, the, the sort of requirements for, um, for that to be successful are outlined in, in what are known as the DiVincenzo criteria. Um, so in order, to, in order to make a quantum computer out of some physical quantum systems, uh, it needs to be, you need to be able to put a lot of uh, those, those um, quantum systems together with well-characterized qubits. Um, you need to be able to initialize, you need to know what the state of those qubits are to begin with in order to do some algorithm. Um, you need to be able to do operations on them before you lose the quantum information. So as I'm sure has been discussed in many other talks, uh, quantum information is a little bit fragile. So, so the name of the game, uh, especially in superconducting qubits, is actually prolonging the lifetime of quantum information. So if you, if you can prepare some interesting uh, quantum superposition state, let's say, um, how long will that persevere before something in the environment perturbs it such that you lose that information? Um, once you have uh, that requirement fulfilled, you need to be able to do all of the quantum logic gates that you would need to to do a computation. Um, and then in the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of an algorithm, you need to be able to actually read out all those individual qubits. And so throughout this talk, we'll we'll touch on on basically all of these all of these points. Um, and so to to maybe to maybe start uh, with 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 a little bit of physics, um, we can talk about harmonic oscillators. And, and there's a, a funny, funny joke in, in, in physics um, that, that most, most physical systems are, are basically either harmonic oscillators or they're basically spins. Uh, and funny enough, superconducting qubits, depending on the time of day and, and the way we're talking about them, um, well, we describe them as both. Uh, but, 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 to, but to start, we can think about harmonic oscillators, uh, which, which are characterized by, as a physical system where uh, the energy of the system kind of oscillates back and forth between uh, being stored in kinetic energy and being stored in potential energy. And um, there's some really archetypical examples of this, like a mass on a spring, where the spring will bounce back and forth um, and um, converting, you know, whether the spring is compressed or extended, that's when it has a lot of potential energy. When it's moving, when the mass is moving quickly, uh, in the middle of that range, it has a lot of kinetic energy. Basically, the exact same thing is true for a pendulum. So, when you have a, a pendulum or, a, or you know swing on a swing set, um, when you're at the at the apex of the of of your of your trajectory, uh, you have a lot of potential energy. And as you move fast through the bottom, uh, all that potential energy is converted to um, uh, to kinetic energy. But more relevantly for superconducting qubits, uh, we're interested in the the behavior of uh, a different type of harmonic oscillator. Uh, what is called an LC circuit, uh, a circuit that's characterized by just having an uh, inductor in, in parallel with a capacitor. And this is the sort of electrical circuit analog of uh, these other types of harmonic oscillators. Um, the energy is stored, the potential energy is stored um, as, uh, as sort of flux in this, in, this, uh, in this inductor, and the kinetic energy is stored by the swashing of, uh, of voltage across the capacitor. Okay, um, and so you can ask yourself, well, this is just an electrical circuit. Um, why would that ever behave quantum mechanically? We, we have these sort of LC oscillators everywhere. You have them on your phone. You have it um, in, in, in any sort of filtering scheme that you would have for, for any electrical circuit. Uh, it has these types, of, these types of things. But in reality, what we need to remember is that anything can really be quantum. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing fundamental about any physical system or any sort of 
broad strokes physical system that precludes it from exhibiting exhibiting quantum mechanical behavior. And um, if if you have any experience from from quantum classes, uh, you've actually solved uh, the the harmonic oscillator um, in sort of like a position and momentum basis. Uh, hopefully that's familiar to, to many of you. Um, and very much equivalently, uh, you can solve it in a basis that's described by voltages and currents in the circuit. Um, and so because we're physicists, we uh, like to use dimensionless, uh, dimensionless quantities. And in a superconducting circuit, uh, what that means is that the, the voltage can get mapped to a charge, which gets mapped to a number of Cooper pairs, which is dimensionless. Cooper pairs are the, the charge carriers of a superconducting circuit um, that, uh, that, um, that describes sort of the capacitive bit of, of, uh, of the circuit. And then um, instead of thinking about currents, uh, we do some variable transformations to get to something called the superconducting phase, which if you're familiar with, um, with superconductivity at all, uh, superconductivity is characterized by a sort of macroscopic wave function where all of the Cooper pairs are are kind of behaving in the same way and, um, and can be described by a superconducting phase. And so going through the math, don't worry about uh, all of these details really. Um, this is just to show you that, that you can indeed write down a Hamiltonian or a quantum description of a, uh, an LC oscillator um, that at least you know, could belong in a quantum textbook. Um, uh, yeah, and 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 be described quantum mechanically, and so here's a here's a maybe a a, a reference if if people are really interested in how that uh, can arise from Maxwell's equations, but um, but again this question like well that's just an LC oscillator why would that ever behave quantum mechanically, um, and and what we can do is actually do experiments that show this and and really what um. The, the reason that I'm showing you this plot is that it's showing direct evidence via a measurement of the quantized nature of excitations in a um, superconducting LC oscillator, where the peaks here represent the uh, number of energy quanta that are stored uh, in this circuit. Um, the distribution here uh, may mean something to some folks if you're familiar with driven oscillators and um, and um, coherent states is, is what they're is what they're called. But so this 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 really brings up a fundamental question of like why why can this thing that you know you could you could make in a little circuit you know at home um, why would why would this behave quantum mechanically? And and again, it's this correspondence between the classical world and the quantum world where um, you, the quantum effects are there. It's just if they're not, it, it, but they're visible only if they're not obscured by interactions with the environment. So in the case of superconducting circuits, uh, superconductors, as you may know, have no dissipation, no energy loss when, when transporting DC currents. So you can put a DC current in a superconducting loop and it'll basically go forever. Um, that's not exactly true at, uh, at higher frequencies, but it's, but it's a good approximation. And it's a good enough approximation such that um, that these circuits will exhibit quantum mechanical behavior. And this was something that was shown uh, very explicitly that a, and, and to use a little bit of jargon, that a degree of freedom that, be, that belongs to a sort of macroscopic uh, state of the system, the superconducting condensate, can indeed uh, exhibit quantum mechanical behavior. And this is something that, that's been an active topic of research in massoscopic physics for, for many decades now, okay? Um, but so in order to realize superconducting qubits, we need, we need one other component uh, in, our, in our circuit toolbox, which is something that has uh, a nonlinearity. So a harmonic oscillator in and of itself uh, can be useful for, for quantum computation and, and, and absolutely is in the, in the field of superconducting qubits. But uh, the real heart of our field is, is a circuit element called a Josephson junction. And Josephson junction is uh, is is really just two superconductors that are barely separated by some kind of uh, insulating region uh, that we call a tunnel barrier. And so, if you have two superconductors that are that are coupled just enough to let some current through, some tunneling uh, across this tunnel barrier, another quantum mechanical effect, 
um, you can realize what amounts to a nonlinear inductor. And so that is something that we employ uh, in superconducting qubits in order to uh, make these circuits uh, controllable in, in, in ways that we, that we know how to control. Um, so this is, a, this is an SEM image, a scanning electron micrograph image of a, of a Josephson junction. This is actually one that I made in graduate school um, where uh, this little overlap region, and let me get uh, my uh, laser pointer so that you can see. If you can, if you can see here, there's a little bit of an overlap region, and that's actually where the Josephson junction is formed. And then there are two leads connecting it to the rest of the circuit um, coming out on either side. So these are very small. Uh, these are on the on length scale, like their length scales of 100 nanometers or so in, in all dimensions, which is really really small, and and requires some sophisticated fabrication techniques to uh, to make. Uh, in this case, it's called electron beam lithography. Um, so once we have once we have that in our in our toolbox, once we have Josephson junctions in our toolbox, what we actually can do is just replace that linear inductor of a, of an LC oscillator with a Josephson junction, which uh, serves to separate the um, spacing between levels uh, in the harmonic oscillator. And this is actually something that's really important. It describes the anharmonicity of the qubit, which sets a speed limit on how fast it can operate. We'll go into some more detail on that later. But really this simple thing, so, so taking, taking a harmonic oscillator, changing one component from an inductor to a Josephson junction, this is what we would call a transmon qubit. And this is by far the most popular superconducting qubit that exists. And it's a, it's a qubit where the properties are tunable basically by, by you know, the value of this shunting capacitance and then some properties of the Josephson junction. In a practical sense, it's really the size of the Josephson junction that sets uh, the parameters. Um, this you know, relatively simple electrical circuit is again the most popular superconducting qubit that exists. Um, so, so it's something that uh, that even though it's a you know this this circuit that like maybe maybe will behave quantum mechanically, maybe won't. Um, it's it's in some sense a miracle that it is so simple that uh, and and that's and that so much progress has been made um, with these simple devices. Um, Kyle, could you briefly stop sharing and reshare? A few people have difficulty seeing the advancement of slides. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Maybe on Linux PCs. Hmm, that's interesting. Let's try it again. Yeah. Um, do, uh, do folks see, it should be on a slide called most common types of superconducting qubits. Okay, with three now, little now circuit I hear diagrams. positive feedback. Great. Okay. Let's continue. Thank you, Kyle. Oh yeah. No, I hope uh I hope I I hope uh, it was it was okay for, for some folks at least. Um people, this was for a few on Linux PCs. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. okay, no problem. So I mentioned um I mentioned this transmon qubit that's uh that's sort of the minimal circuit that you can make out of Josephson junction, out of a Josephson junction. Um, but there are some other really popular types of superconducting qubits, although although transmons are, are the most popular. There's something called a flux qubit, which then adds a couple of other Josephson junctions in a, to make a loop. Um, and then there's something called the fluxonium qubit, which really combines the three circuit elements that we tend to use uh, in these devices, capacitors, Josephson junctions, and, and inductors. Um, to, to realize different superconducting qubits with different parameters that are tailorable, again, by these, uh, the, the, the sort of features of the circuit elements, the parameters of the circuit elements, the capacitance, the value of the inductance, the size of the Josephson junction. But just by rearranging the components or adding new components, you can change fundamentally the behavior of the circuit. And so I'm not gonna get into the detail of this um, uh, in this talk, but this is something that's, that's a really active area of research where folks are trying to um, encode information in different degrees of freedom of these circuits uh, and, and looking for ways to do that such that it's uh, less, um, less susceptible to, to errors. And so uh, down here, there's an example of something that's, that's quite a bit more complicated that's called the zero pi qubit. Um, 
that that still combines these same circuit elements, but but does it in a in a complicated a little bit more complicated way that has interesting properties. Um, and so for the rest of the talk, I'm really just going to talk about transmon qubits uh, because they're so simple. And one of the one of the reasons that they're so simple is that uh, you know again we're just replacing the the inductor of a harmonic oscillator with a Josephson junction. You can kind of use any intuition that you have for LC oscillators um, or any harmonic oscillator uh, to describe at least some properties of the transmon. And so something that's important to note is that superconducting qubits will have some natural frequency, just like you know when you when you pluck a guitar string or or uh, or play or play a piano a note on the piano. There's some fundamental frequency that they that they will. Um, I hesitate to use, use the word resonate because it's not it's not exactly the same as that, but there's a fundamental frequency uh, that they will interact with, um, and and this is tunable by those parameters. So uh, for for some energy scale, superconducting qubits or at least transmon qubits uh, work at about five gigahertz, which is which is um, which is pretty fast. Uh, this is what we call like a microwave frequency um, on the electromagnetic spectrum, and and it's important to note that. By choosing different aspects of the circuit, again those those parameters of the of the device, the the features, the fundamental frequency and the other properties are engineerable. And so to put it in context, again, so microwaves uh, sort of live um, uh, in this region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, it's relatively low energy compared to to things like um, like visible light or or ionizing radiation such as X rays and gamma rays. So it's it's not you know something that um that is that's that's really visible, but it is really useful in telecom and and other technologies. So so again, I mentioned transmon qubits kind of live at five gigahertz, but other superconducting qubits use uh, a wide frequency spectrum from let's say 100 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. Uh, to put it in context, your microwave oven uh, specifically uses 2.45 gigahertz, so kind of right in the middle of that range. Uh, funny enough. Um, 4G and LTE uh, cell service also uses a very similar range. Um, but it's interesting to note that 5G uh, is, and, and, and as, as sort of telecom technology uh, improves, it actually gets a higher and higher frequency, uh, just as a little, a little aside. Um, and so uh, revisiting this transmon circuit, um, we, we, can, we can tune parameters of the device to to change their prop the properties of the circuit, um, and and the way that we do them is actually we we don't actually you know buy a capacitor uh, from from a store and, and plug it into a chip, and a Josephson junction and plug it into the chip. We fabricate it um, on a, a wafer scale fabrication. But before we get to that, um, we'll spend a few minutes of talking about what the actual um, sort of quantum states of this qubit actually are, and so. Um, one of the one of the maybe downsides of these engineered quantum systems, uh, at least in some cases, is that the the underlying quantum states that uh, that describe the describe the the the, the yeah the, the 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 actual physical dynamics of the system um, they're not so easy to interpret. So um, as I mentioned, there's the notion of the superconducting phase. And then there's the notion of like the Cooper pairs that have that are living on a superconducting uh, island, and those are sort of the canonically conjugate variables uh, that we use in in in, in basically all superconducting qubits. And so in that picture, you can you can do uh, you can solve the Schrodinger equation uh, with the Hamiltonian of the transmon in a couple of different bases. In the same way that you would uh, maybe solve a regular harmonic oscillator in the position or momentum basis, um, and and you can represent those wave functions in those bases, and so uh, the states of the transmon, really just to say, uh, are are described as distributions of this superconducting phase, where each of these levels uh, represents the energy eigenstates of the transmon, um, and then equivalently because they're canonically conjugate variables. Um, you can represent it as a distribution of the of the charges. So this is the uh, sorry. These are flipped. The one on the left is the first excited state, and the one on the right is the ground state. Um, 
you can you can solve these uh, pretty easily if you have uh, familiarity with numerical techniques in Python or Mathematica, so on and so forth. If you don't have that, or even if you do, a really nice tool to play around with to get or get started on designing super done qubits is a is an open source Python package called SC qubits. Um, it's a it's a Python toolkit that even has a GUI that's built in that allows you to uh, sort of tune the parameters of uh, some popular superdome qubits, including transmons and fluxoniums and so on. Um, and it all in it and it sort of uh, returns all of this in a nice, uh, easy to digest um, way. Um, I won't get into too many of the details uh, of this like device tunability aspect because it it's you know it's not necessarily relevant for um, for folks just getting introduced, but um, it's worth noting that just by changing parameters of the circuit, uh, we can engineer some uh, sensitivity or insensitivity to various like deleterious effects of the environment. And so in transmon qubits, uh, just to, just to get it out there for folks who may be a little bit familiar, uh, there's a problem uh, that has been solved related to noise from just noisy charges oscillating in the environment. Uh, and by changing the ratio of the parameters describing the Josephson junction and the capacitor, this energy scale EJ and energy scale EC, uh, by increasing that ratio, uh, you can suppress sensitivity to, to that type of um, error. Okay, um, maybe that's a good point to to pause and and see if there's any questions on the first bit of the talk because that's that's kind of the um, the the baseline background of super nanny qubits. And now I'm going to start talking about uh, how we interact with them, what they look like, you know, in real life, so on and so forth. Everyone has done a phenomenal job explaining the, the answers to each other, so please continue. Awesome, great. Uh, glad to hear it. Um, so uh, something, you know, in, in building up a quantum system, uh, you, met, you need to be able to read out the state of, of the qubits. We do that by, uh, by coupling uh, the superconducting qubit to a harmonic oscillator, a superconducting resonator. Uh, that's made using the same materials on the same chip, typically, and um, there's a there's a simple interaction Hamiltonian that one can write down. Uh, this is called the dispersive limit of the James Cummings Hamiltonian. For those interested, um, and and basically when you when you engineer this circuit, uh, you get a, an interesting effect, which is a shift of the fundamental frequency of the qubit and the resonator or the resonator based on the state of the other system. So if you put an excitation in the qubit, if you take it from the ground to the first excited state, the that red resonator frequency will actually shift a little bit. And so that's something that we can measure. So if we if we send in uh, some microwave signal to look at the transmission through this, uh, this resonator or the reflection off of this resonator, what we'll see as a function of the frequency of that signal are two responses uh, depending on the state of the qubit. And so what you can imagine doing is, is sitting at a particular frequency uh, uh, described by this, this x-axis here and looking at the amplitude of the signal that goes through or the phase. So we're working with um, now AC signals, which have an amplitude and a phase. Uh, and you can use that information to distinguish the state of the qubit. So uh, we actually use these linear superconducting resonators as a critical resource uh, for reading out superconducting qubits. Okay. Um, and uh, there's a question. So, so now that we've built up this quantum system, what does it look like in practice? So we have a we go from a circuit, we pattern it on a chip, and I'll talk about how we do that in a slide or two. Um, we put that chip into a package because there's some wires that we need to connect in order to control and read out the state of the qubit, and the package serves as an interface between the chip and sort of the, you know, the wiring, the, the, the things that you would solder or connectorize um, to send in those signals. We then put that in a dilution refrigerator. And so this is something that's that's maybe a disadvantage of superconducting qubits, which is they need to be really cold. And the reason for that is that the qubits need to be superconducting uh, primarily. Um, and, and a lot of superconducting materials are really only cold below, uh, let's say 10 Kelvin or so, but our favorite aluminum is actually only a superconductor uh, below uh, 1.2 Kelvin or so. 
And in order to be much, much lower than that, to really be able to observe quantum mechanical effects, uh, we put them in a dilution refrigerator that gets down to 10 millikelvin uh, temperatures. Uh, so that's much, much colder than outer space, which is like three Kelvin. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's something that we work with every day, which is exciting. Um, and, and it's maybe worth noting that this really complicated piece of machinery is actually commercially available. Uh, so Blue Force is one company, but there's many others uh, that, 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 that make this type of refrigerator. And, um, and then we hook it up with sort of uh, commercially available control electronics. Uh, be it you know microwave generators or 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 DC uh, signal generators, and then to control all of that, we just use an off-the-shelf normal computer. This one looks like a Mac, but it's typically a Windows PC. Um, so how do we actually fabricate super nanny qubits? Again, it uses relatively standard semiconductor fabrication processes. Um, down here, uh, there's sort of a series of of zoom-ins of a of a of a qubit device. Uh, this is a, sort of a, a, a big wafer where we pattern a lot of chips that would that would become superconducting quantum processors, um, and uh, and then zooming in, this is uh, another scanning electron micrograph. So there's a chip with five qubits on it that are in a line; they're all connected to each other, um, so that you can have interactions between them. Zooming in further, this uh, little X uh, feature here. Is actually the one capacitor paddle of the of the circuit of the of the transmon qubit. Zooming in even further, there's actually a loop with two Josephson junctions, which makes a tunable transmon, which I'll get to also in a few slides. And zooming in even further down to again this hundred nanometer or so level, uh, we have the Josephson junction itself, which here is actually this overlap region uh, that I'm kind of outlining uh, with the laser pointer. Uh, and so with those circuits, we, we already made a departure. We made a departure from this idealized, um, you know, drawing of a circuit, which is just capacitors and inductors and Josephson junctions. We put it on a chip. Um, and what this means is that we're not working with what we would call lumped element circuits, which have discrete uh, elements that are capacitors and inductors, we're working with distributed circuits. And uh, basically any two pieces of metal will have some capacitance between them and any uh, metal wire will have some inductance associated with it. And so it's just the fact that the capacitances and inductances aren't really point source localized anymore in these devices. They're distributed across you know, some space. And, and we can actually use commercially available uh, simulation packages uh, to, to really, to really um, uh, get at all the properties that we, that we need. Um, I mentioned the, the dilution refrigerators. There's a lot of what we would call cryogenic engineering that goes into the operation of superconducting qubits. Um, uh, and, and there are a lot of components that are most of the time also commercially available uh, that we use to uh, sort of shield the qubits from, um, from the radiation of the outside world uh, so that they aren't, um, so they don't lose their information too quickly. Um, it's a great, point to make a comment that uh, superconducting quantum computers are, are in, in, have been in the press a lot. Uh, and most of the pictures that they use are, are these really shiny, really nice, really complicated looking pictures uh, that are really just the dilution refrigerators, um, which are an integral part of a superconducting quantum system. But it's not actually the qubits themselves. So in both of these pictures, um, it looks like here is, uh, is the quantum chip in in this image from, from IBM, uh, well, maybe not, it, a press release uh, from IBM. And then somewhere somewhere in this mess of cables, there's a similar little device package that, uh, that's, in, that's in Google's um, quantum, quantum processor. Um, again, there's like a lot of quantum uh, out in the world. Uh, many things are not quantum, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, you know, th there are a lot of commercially available components. Um, it's worth noting, if anyone has seen the new uh, season of Black Mirror, uh, there's an episode that deals with quantum uh, stuff, and they absolutely just used a mock-up of a dilution refrigerator uh, as their actual quantum computer, which, uh, well, I chuckled when I saw it. It's, uh, it it's, it's a nice, um, they, did, they did at least a little bit of homework, which was nice. Um, 
I won't go through this too much. It, it's not necessarily relevant, but but there's a point to be made that um, a lot of big companies are uh, developing hardware specifically for the control of superconducting qubits and other quantum systems. Um, uh, a lot of these are microwave companies that uh, have a lot of experience in like the radar industry. Uh, we get to leverage a lot of a lot of uh, that experience. Um, even at the control software stage, there are a lot of um, a lot of packages that are that are available for use either either through subscription services or open source. Um, so there's a lot of community around a lot of the infrastructure that's needed to run these experiments. Um, one quick aside before we talk about the actual control of qubits, um, and and maybe this is something that doesn't need to be described in too much detail, uh, but when we talk about qubits uh, and differentiating them from classical bits of information, uh, one way to represent them is using this block sphere representation, where the pure states of a qubit are represented by any points on the surface of a sphere. And, um, and when you do so, um, you can write any arbitrary single qubit wave function uh, as parameterized in polar coordinates uh, with some theta and, and, and phi variables. And one thing that's really nice about superconducting qubits is that we can perform what we would call arbitrary single qubit rotations, which means any gate that we want to do on a single qubit we can do, and meaning we can set theta and phi in this picture to whatever we want. And we can do that uh, with microwave pulses. Aside number two is that in practice, we need some tunability of our qubits. We need to be able to turn on and off interactions uh, between qubits. Uh, and the way that we typically do that is by engineering a Josephson junction or a proxy for the Josephson junction that is uh, tunable with some external parameter. Uh, the most common is uh, making a loop with two Josephson junctions that you can thread some magnetic flux through. That changes the properties of, of this little element although it really behaves pretty much like a Josephson junction still, or uh, something that's been picking up steam, but is still in its relative infancy, is using uh, different materials to make the Josephson junctions that you can tune just with a voltage. Um, but so this, this adds a lot of, another degree of control uh, to superconducting qubits is really useful. So how do we perform single qubit gates? As I mentioned, we use microwave drives that are resonant with the qubit transition, and we can do arbitrary uh, rotations of the qubit around different axes by controlling um, sort of the phase of that signal. Um, the phase of that signal or that pulse uh, can be represented in these quadrature coordinates, which is which is maybe a little bit too technical for this, but it's worth noting that uh, we apply some uh, pulse envelope to a microwave signal, uh, which then gets into the qubit and allows us to do these rotations. And these signals are generated again by just commercially available hardware. Um, we use we use typically uh, you know microwave uh, pulses for readout and control, but then for setting uh, the qubit bias parameter. So this is like the the tunability aspect of the qubits. That's often at a lower frequency um, than the direct qubit uh, single qubit gates, but but not exclusively. In order to do two qubit gates between superconducting qubits, uh, what we want to do is turn on and off the coupling between, let's say, two adjacent qubits. And this is something that uh, superconducting qubits are uh, a little bit limited in, which is that when we pattern them on a chip, we're kind of fixed. Their locations are fixed. We can't pick them up and move them um, in the middle of an experiment. That's something that's really nice about uh, other uh, quantum systems like uh, trapped ions and neutral atoms they have the ability to physically move around the qubits during an experiment, which, which opens up other opportunities for them to, to, to do uh, entangling operations, these two qubit gates. Um, when we do two qubit gates in superdining qubits, uh, there's a couple of ways we can do it. We can sort of change the frequencies of the qubits uh, to uh, make them interact. We can use microwave drives or modulate that coupling. Um, in order to generate entanglement or or even more sophisticated things. Um, it's worth noting here the fidelities with which we can do these entangling operations, uh, which are exceeding 99%. And even this table from just a few years ago is, is outdated at this point. Um, some, some more recent uh, efforts uh, have really pushed, pushed the boundaries of, of two qubit gate fidelities, these entangling operations between 
uh, adjacent superconducting qubits on a chip. Um, and, and we're really pushing above the 99.9% .9 fidelity level. And what that means is that for every time that we do this, or let's say we could do this um, a thousand times before we would have an error in that operation, which is really, which is really pushing the boundaries of, uh, uh, of what we can do. There's still a lot of room for improvement in superconducting qubits, and this is something that I'm really excited about. This is this is something that, um, you know, in spite of all of the success of superconducting qubits, there are still a lot of avenues for improvement uh, going around, running the whole gambit from the way we design the devices, the materials that we use to fabricate them, shielding them from the environment, like I mentioned in our cryostats, uh, the way we actually do the control of the qubits, and then, you know, iterating with some theory and analysis of these experiments. Um, and we like to think that this is sort of a of a cycle of improvement, but um, but in reality, it's it's all of them sort of feeding in on each other, which is really interesting. That makes it a really dynamic field to work in. Um, that's a lot of fun. And so uh, over the years, the sort of lifetime of these qubits, which is one of the metrics that we really care about, uh, has been steadily improving. Um, people say that it's been slowing down recently, which is which is maybe true. Um, but but we're really still pushing the boundaries of single qubit performance uh, in sort of all superconducting qubit uh, you know flavors. Um, I'm going to uh, harp a little bit on the materials that we use because people realize that one of the primary limiters of superconducting qubits is really the materials that are that are being used. Um, and so there's been a lot of work uh, looking at using different superconductors, uh, improving the design of the qubits. And um, and really doing materials analysis to understand uh, exactly what the limitations are, and we're already at the point where we can do for single qubit gates, you know, ten to the four or even ten to the five operations. Um, well, let's say ten to the four <laughs> operations uh, in a qubit lifetime, which is which is really good on this DiVincenzo criteria um, scale. Our field is really pushing toward um, toward more more complicated experiments. And something that people realize is going to be really critical for the progression is encoding information in ways that uh, that's sort of insensitive to um, the common errors that qubits undergo. These are called uh, sort of error correction techniques uh, toward fault tolerant quantum computing. And there's been a lot of progress in this just within the last couple of years, both from big industrial efforts like Google as well as academic efforts. This was this was done back at Yale. Um, as, a, as another sort of trajectory of the field, um, the, the large companies are, are, are playing a big role in sort of defining uh, where things are looking in the long term, at least. Um, people realize that it's going to take a lot of qubits and, and a lot of effort to build a sort of universal quantum computer out of superconducting qubits or, or, any, or any hardware. Um, that's going to take many, many years. Uh, and, and really, it's going to push to bigger and bigger systems. In the meantime, we're looking at ways that sort of smaller systems can uh, can inform us and or, or inform our architectural choices, as well as um, as well as you know prove to be useful in the near term. So there are many there are many companies, and this is this is not even a, a exhaustive list, but there are many there are many companies that have um, sort of processors that people can can use either on cloud services or they're using them internally. And they're looking for ways to, to sort of do small scale algorithms and calculations that could prove to be uh, an improvement over classical um, classical things. Um, and so uh, this is the last thing I'll say, which is that um, it's really hard to define exactly what, what quantum advantage is, something that can kind of change um, as, as classical computing improves. Um, but, but that's something that people are really looking for. Um, here are a couple of references. Uh, I know this talk will be recorded. Um, so for y'all getting uh, sort of just started on superconducting qubits, these are, these are some things that I would recommend. Uh, IBM has a really nice resource called Qiskit. Um, the rest of these are, are more academic papers for, for maybe graduate level or undergraduate level students. And then play around with this SQ qubits package. It's really, it's really useful. Um, I want to thank folks on my team uh, at MIT Lincoln Lab and at MIT, uh, many of whom helped out with some of these slides. Uh, 
and really I want to conclude by saying, you know, Super 90 Qubits are a really exciting platform. And, um, and uh, if you're interested in it, I'm really happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully this, uh, this notion of an engineered quantum system that's useful for computation um, is exciting to you. So happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you, Kyle. This was really a great talk. And there are many questions that I will now shoot at you. Okay. The questions is about dilution refrigerators. And mm. uh, first, how do they work uh, briefly? And then yeah. are there any attempts to make, to bring this to room temperature? How about high temperature mm. conductors? Will this be a possibility? Yeah. So, so both great questions. Um, dilution, I'll, I'll answer the first one first. It's dilution refrigerators. Um, use a thermodynamic process that uh, is uh, what you would call endothermic. So in a dilution refrigerator, there's a, there's a vacuum circuit. So a, a circuit that is isolated from air outside the world that has a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. And once those isotopes of helium, of helium uh, get cold enough, they'll actually separate into two phases. So, and this is like from, from gravity. Um, so there'll be a phase at the bottom that is more helium four because it's heavier and a phase at the top that's more helium three because it's a little bit lighter. And what a dilution refrigerator does is it actually sort of sucks the helium three through the helium four and the process of the helium three crossing that phase boundary takes energy. And if it takes energy, it needs to get it from somewhere and it gets it from the the metal and just the, the the environment around it and so we put our qubits really close to that point uh it's called the mixing chamber in a in a dilution refrigerator and uh and that process actually takes away heat from from the experiment um uh and then the other question was uh is there is there any attempts to to make this room temperature that would be great that would be really really impressive um, and, and would be honestly, I think a game changer for a lot of things. Um, maybe the short answer is it's real hard and, um, uh, high temperature superconductors, that's, that's a, that's a field in and of itself. Um, and so I would argue that, you know, should, should superconducting, you know, should high temperature superconductors that are amenable to making Josephson junctions that are of high quality, um, sort of begin to compete with, uh, sort of the low temperature superconductors that we use today. Absolutely, there would be a push to to do that, but um, I would argue that maybe maybe right now it's still parallel development paths. So the qubits will keep developing uh, using the materials that they have, but and and the uh, and the high temperature superconductors will develop. That's that's a very fundamental materials research question. Yeah, okay, that uh, was great question. questions. And then Haisa and then Madalina will follow. Um, another interesting question. First, what is the main limiting factor for the lifetime of the transmon qubit? Mm -hmm. But then, uh, what is the lifetime of the whole chip? Is there a certain durability, months, years? Ah, yeah, great questions. So um, the, the primary limiters of transmons are the materials. So when we make a superconductor, it is in principle lossless, like it doesn't absorb energy um, into the charge carriers because they're all uh, Cooper pairs and the gap for those excitations is much larger than the qubit frequency. But um, that's only half the story. So in a qubit, uh, let's say half the energy is stored in the currents. The other half is stored in the voltages. And that's that's basically this, um, uh, you know, analogous to a analogous to a harmonic oscillator. And the materials that we use can have you know little bits of crud on them. And even if it's not crud and dirt. Uh, it could just be um, sort of defects at the interfaces or oxide layers that sort of naturally grow on, on these materials that can absorb energy from the qubit. And so a lot of the, a lot of the improvements to, to superconducting qubits over the last handful of years have been from improvements of the materials and the processing that we use in, in fabrication. Um, and then the, what was the, what was the second question? It was about... Um, yeah, the whole chip. Uh, the whole chip, yeah. Certain durability. Yeah. So they the the properties change a little bit over time, but there are ways to mitigate that. Um, they don't they don't exactly go bad, 
So like we have we have devices in fridges that are you know were made five years ago and they get cooled down periodically and we test them and 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 things aren't things don't go catastrophically wrong. Um, but uh, but they do they do sort of age they age over time, um, but but not in such a severe way. Something that is really important though is uniformity. So if you make a chip that has a bunch a bunch of qubits, uh, they all need to work. Or if they don't need to work, that sort of puts limitations on your, or more of a strain, I guess, on your um, quantum error correction uh, protocol, which is which is maybe a related uh, topic. Okay, we have about a hundred questions left and three minutes. Uh, hi, sir. What is next? Yes. So after preparing qubits on the given material sheets, how do we integrate it with the software that runs the computer? How do you verify that it is working according to it? to its intended purpose. So after the publication, yeah, what happens? Yeah, so so I didn't get I didn't get the first part of your question, but I but I think I can answer the the second bit, which is that the the information does get transferred between sort of like a quantum channel and a classical channel. And this this occurs when we do the measurements of the qubit. That information is now basically a bit it's called a projective measurement of the quantum system um, and so when we do the measurement it will project the qubit into uh, one of its states even if it was in a superposition and 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 that is that is sort of a way of making making the information classical and so once it gets transported out the fridge into our normal computer it's all kind of um, uh, natural I guess information sharing does that does does that answer the question? Uh, yes, it answers the question. Yeah. Next question by Madalina. Who doesn't hear it? So I will ask the next question. Um, namely, is it possible to produce a synergy among the different approaches for hardware, quantum hardware development, build bridges between trapped ions and neutral atoms and supercompacting qubits? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, much of much of the development of these systems has been uh, not necessarily independent, but you know, not um, not necessarily together. We we we've been learning from each other, but. Um, but but you bring up a great point, which is that different hardware modalities have different advantages. So some are maybe easier to uh, use to transmit information over longer distances. Uh, so like photons at the at visible frequencies in low loss optical fibers are a great way to transmit information over long distances. That's how we do it, like under how we transmit, a, I think it's how we transmit internet signals um, underneath the oceans, for instance. Um, and uh, and that's definitely something that people are working on. They're working on, and and really, what it relies on is um, converting from the frequency bands that one hardware modality works at to another. So micro or supernova qubits work at microwave frequencies. Others work at optical frequencies. And uh, there's a whole field of research looking to do what's called transduction, which is taking quantum information at microwave frequencies and converting it to quantum information at optical frequencies in a way that preserves that quantum information. That's a hard problem, but people are definitely working on it. Then, uh, and feel free to unmute Madalina once you're ready. Uh, can you briefly comment on what the new uh, new types of superconducting qubits really are? Uh, fluxonium, coax mon, how do they mainly differ? Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they really differ in a, in a fundamental way in how, what the the sort of more microscopic degrees of freedom that the quantum information is stored in are. So all of these circuits, uh, you know, it, we're using the the two lowest energy states of, of this of this circuit, which is which has many many energy states uh, as a qubit. But um, but you can do the you can engineer a circuit such that the that information is encoded in ways that are harder to access by the environment. Um, so talking about, we can, I can mention the fluxonium qubit, for instance. Um, the, the way the fluxonium qubit 
works and is maybe is maybe an advantage over transmons is allows you to operate at a much lower frequency than a transmon without sacrificing uh in the same way at least uh protection against um certain certain uh decoherence mechanisms and um and the reason that that low frequency is really useful is that uh as i mentioned before uh the primary limiting factors are uh, for for cubic coherence are these like lossy materials that couple in like to the capacitor of the of the qubit and a capacitor if you're if you're familiar with with any um like circuit design is kind of like a high pass filter so a capacitor is better at transmitting um higher frequencies than lower frequencies and so a lower frequency qubit has a harder time sending its signal through a capacitor into a lossy environment um, and so that's that's one one way that uh, that different qubit circuits can can offer improvements in performance. Great. And soon after, we will have the lab tool by IQM, and IQM introduced another type of qubit, the Unimon, about mm -hmm. which you can see then. The last question will be asked by Madalina. Uh, first, um, could you please comment a little bit on the parameters that affect T1 and T2 for superconducting qubits? Mm -hmm. So, so T1, um, T1 is sort of by definition um, related to the, the ability for the qubit to emit its energy or accept energy from the environment at its, at its like fundamental frequency. Um, and so uh, for superconducting qubits, you can, you can tailor that um, by, by changing the circuit and changing the frequency that it operates at. Uh, you can change that by um by using using better materials that have an, an, an engineering or environment such that uh there isn't any way for energy exchange to happen between the qubit and the environment or those materials um and and again this notion of encoding the information in a clever way that's just harder for the environment to capture um you can think about uh these that that process as being one that is um related to measurements of the quantum state. And so uh, you can imagine that, you know, if 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 a qubit was just a color, red and red or blue for ground or first excited state, if you could just look at it and see the color, um, then that would be really easy to distinguish that information and and um and cause errors uh or 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 you know reduce T1 or T2. Um, but if you but if you make that information sort of hidden in some way, um, you know, and, and any number of ways like um, like uh, you know whether a battery in something has power or not, uh, as being how the information is encoded, that can that can give you some protection. Um, and then for for T two, practically speaking, uh, so T two is related to T one, but there's an additional component that comes from. Uh, how the that fundamental frequency of the qubit moves and changes over time so you want that frequency to be extremely extremely stable um uh and and so when we when we engineer these supernutting qubits uh in order to have some tunability to change how they interact with other qubits around them uh, or 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 sometimes we use it for control as well having as little sensitivity to those external knobs as possible is is one way to improve t2 um it's also related to the materials and and the environment as well uh but that's maybe one way to distinguish between the two fantastic thank you very much kyle for this really exciting session great talk and great insight in the q a we'd love to keep in touch there are more questions that I would love to share with you and we will put the recording on um, on YouTube tonight so everyone can watch it and review everything thank you very much Kyle it was really a pleasure having you yeah no thank you so much this was this was a lot of fun um and again thank you to all the organizers for for all the awesome work that you're doing um this is a really exciting really exciting event so so thanks <laughs>